Um, okay, so um, moving on now, we have uh, David Anderson, uh, who is uh, joining us from, um, uh, I think, Leicester at the moment. David yeah. is a health advisor with uh, UK Med at the moment, but that title hides decades of experience in the NHS as a senior nurse manager um, and multiple deployments with various NGOs uh, and organisations in outbreak response and in sudden onset disaster response in various parts of the world, including um, the West African um, Ebola outbreak in 2014, 2015, and then latterly uh, with me in uh, Bangladesh uh, with UK EMT, which is where we met for the first time, and also in Samoa uh, with the measles outbreak response as well. More recently, David was appointed as the director of one of the Nightingale hospitals, a director of uh, quality and of infection prevention and control. So a really broad and very impressive uh, um, CV, particularly in humanitarian aid work. Um, and that's probably enough. And if he's on the line, hopefully he can uh, give us his talk now. David, are you there? I am, Stephen. Hopefully, oops, hopefully you can see me. Yeah, all good. Oh, thank you. Sorry about that. So, um, <clears throat> Good morning, all. I just thought I'd start off by giving you a brief overview of UK Med and what it is that we do. Could you share oh, your slides, David? Oh, I thought I was, Stephen. Sorry, mate. It's all right. My technology skills fail me once again. Don't worry, take your time. Not unusual for me. That's it. They're great now. Just stick them on there. Oh, thank you, Stephen. Cheers, mate. So, yes, uh, just start again. I, so good morning all, um, I just thought I'd give you a quick overview of UK Med and UK EMT. So UK Med is a, a, an NGO which was founded by uh, Tony Redmond, so Professor Tony Redmond, who originally started the South Manchester Accident Rescue Team, uh, who responded to many, many, many different uh, crises over the years from Armenia back in 1988 across many different responses. That then morphed into uh, UK Med, and UK Med really began to come of age, as it were, as Stephen alluded to, with the 2014-2015 unfortunate um, Ebola outbreak in Sierra Leone. So UK Med were asked to coordinate the response on behalf of the British government, um, and deployed somewhere in the region of 170 uh, British clinicians to work in a variety of Ebola treatment centres across Sierra Leone, um, of which I was lucky enough to be one of the clinicians in wave two and stayed for three and a half, four months to run two Ebola treatment centres in the end for International Medical Corps. But just on, on that, we then have done many other responses. Um, as Stephen again has, has mentioned, we did Bangladesh with the diphtheria response, laterally Samoa for a measles response. And then most recently, um, this year, we've been working in many countries, nine countries, uh, for responding to the coronavirus outbreak. And um, so we're a health NGO, um, which is quite small. We're small relative to many of the big NGOs, which some of, you, some of the other speakers have been talking about, you know, Save the Children, etc., cetera, are massive compared to us. But one of the beauties of us is that we are a very small and agile um, NGO, which means we can deploy very rapidly and deploy small teams. So we also have a unique access to a huge cadre of uh, NHS staff. So it was really, UK Med was really founded on the principle of taking the absolutely brilliant uh, staff which we have in the NHS, getting a, uh, agreements with their, their trusts as it is now to allow them to be released to respond to you know, uh, traumatic events, so sudden onset disasters, outbreak responses, um, and, and use the clinical skills which have been hugely developed in, in the UK to provide that fundamental support to other countries as and when it's required. We also have a very strong background in uh, emergency preparedness. So we've run programmes uh, in Myanmar, South Africa and South Sudan, all of which I've been lucky enough to be involved in, to help with preparedness. So Myanmar was for um, major incident planning in relation to uh, earthquakes. South Africa was actually co uh, coronavirus preparedness uh, and I was the case management lead for that in South Africa. And in South Sudan, that was mainly around trauma in the southern region of South Sudan. 
Um, so we have a huge uh, portfolio of systems and, and, and things that we are prepared to deploy into from the very complex through to the less complex. Um, okay. So as part of UK Med, we are part of a very large partnership. So we run the UK EMT, which is the UK Emergency Medical Team, of which Stephen is part of. And, and that is funded by FCDO or DFID as was. Um, and that allows us to respond with a, a field hospital of many different types. So you'll see in the middle of the screen, that is our full type two field hospital. A type two field hospital is one which has the ability to carry out uh, both major and minor operations and has inpatient facilities and is a very large undertaking. We also have a type one field hospital, which is more, technically it's called outpatients, but it's more of a small emergency department and also an outbreak response specialist team for which I am the clinical lead, uh, which has been heavily used this year, unfortunately. We do all of that in partnership with the fire and rescue uh, services, so USAR, ISAR, um, and most of our responses come e either via the, the secretariat, the EMT secretariat in Geneva, who requests support on behalf of the affected country, or via the Ministry of Health in the country itself. So the, the most recent response, which would be the Lebanese response uh, in Beirut, was really uh, a response which came via the uh, Secretariat in Geneva on behalf of the ENT, um, and one which we were very happy to respond to, but we'll come on to that in a second. Seems a bit strange not getting questions as I go along, but there you go. So focusing slightly more on the COVID response and what we have done. So as I was saying, we have deployed into nine different countries this year. Uh, I won't go through them all, but just as an example, I was in South Africa, then Manchester, which was technically a deployment for us to help support the setup of the Manchester Nightingale, um, Beirut, so Lebanon, Burkina Faso, Zambia, South Africa, Cambodia, many different countries. And some of our responses remain ongoing. Um, particularly in Beirut, we have a, a largest response in relation to coronavirus, um, which is actually about to expand. So, so far in relation to the UK EMT, we have deployed over 50 staff this year since February um, into nine countries, trained many, many staff, uh, over 2,000 local staff in areas as diverse as infection control, risk communications and case management. Many of our, the, the previous speakers have talked about supporting SOPs and making sure that you have the correct information and pathways in place. And that's hugely important. So we have we've done a lot of work in many different countries to help support that. We also deployed into the largest refugee camp uh, in the world at the moment, which is Cox's Bazaar. We were there previously in 2018, I think it was, um, to support diphtheria, but we are now there uh, helping to set up and run uh, SARI ITC. So we have 240 beds, uh, as well as quarantine facilities. And we're working very closely with IOM to run those facilities. We also work very closely with Save the Children um, in Cox's Bazaar. It's a huge response in what is a very challenging um, environment in Cox's Bazaar in Bangladesh, given the very difficult conditions in which the uh, refugees are living in. So some of the other responses, uh, as I previously mentioned, that we've done so far this year, we helped set up the Nightingale in Manchester, which was uh, one of those ones which I think don't, I never really wanted to do in my own country, uh, but we had a small team of us, as Stephen said, I was the director of IPC and quality. It was uh, Professor Redmond was with us as well as the medical director and Sarah Collis as an IPC lead. Uh, Sarah's being one of the other health advisors for UK Med. And that in itself was a huge challenge given we had two weeks to uh, effectively in the GMEX in Manchester design, uh, build and, and open 648 uh, level two beds for use in coronavirus. Thankfully, we only ever actually opened and used a, a circa 70 patients, I think was as much as we ever got to. And it is happily now uh, mothballed uh, for the current time. 
which is good at the moment. Uh, we also support um, in Greece with a lot of the community ITCs in Moria Camp. We have a small team in Yemen doing ICU and IPC support. Uh, South Africa's case manager said I was there earlier this year and many other responses which are still ongoing. We are heavily involved in research um, and we're helping to support the, de the development of the faculty in, of remote and rural and humanitarian healthcare with uh, the Edinburgh College. Uh, we're still doing a lot of work in Samoa with a feasibility study. Um, and we've recently been doing a lot of work in relation to climate change and the impact that has on humanitarian work and humanitarian responses. And that is in, it, with Save the Children. We also um, get involved in other global projects. Um, so most of you will probably not have heard of a thing called the Ready Project. The Ready Project is a global project, which is one where there's a partnership of NGOs who are developing a strategy to be able to respond very rapidly to a sudden outbreaks of diseases. Uh, this was being put in place before COVID and unfortunately was not in place in time. But it, that continues on to be able to respond to things like COVID, but also outbreaks of Ebola, uh, Lassa, et cetera. Uh, and it is a really good initiative with Save the Children, Aid Malaysia, USA Aid, and um, UK Med, as well as being sponsored by FCDO. So one of the things that Stephen asked me to talk to you about was our Beirut explosion response. So I was on the initial assessment team, which went out. We left two days after the explosion, but arrived in Beirut three days post explosion. Um, and what we very quickly established was that the, the people of Beirut, whilst Tragically, there were over 200 people killed, and that number does vary greatly. When I left Beirut some five weeks ago, we thought it was about 250. Uh, there were over 6,000 casualties, but, but what, what actually happened in that very short period of time was that the, the people of Beirut and the hospitals just dealt with those casualties over 24, 48 hours. Uh, absolutely unbelievable the way they managed to deal with a huge volume of casualties at the same time as having three hospitals within the blast zone, which were fundamentally destroyed and um, evacuating those hospitals. It was circa 500 beds. And at the same time, dealing with casualties which were appearing still at those hospitals um, is just completely amazing. There were roughly 300,000 people displaced. Um, and this slide tries to show you the blast zone and where the impact was most heavily felt. So the blast happened, it's quite difficult to see, it's a very small grey uh, area where my cursor is currently, um, but it impacted on quite a large zone. This is a very densely packed area with three of the, the major hospitals in um, Beirut. And the tragic thing was that, that Beirut was really well prepared for coronavirus. Uh, they had set up some really good units to be able to handle intensive care cases, and they were really well on the front foot with very, very few cases. Unfortunately, the three hospitals which were impacted by the blast were the three main hospitals which had been selected to manage intensive care cases for uh, coronavirus. So they, pretty much the entire capacity for uh, coronavirus was wiped out in the space of five minutes uh, in these three hospitals, which you can see uh, indicated by the H's in the deep red colour. The people of, um, I say the people of Beirut responded hugely well to that, but uh, Lebanon and Beirut are fundamentally very, very, very difficult context to be in. Uh, there is a very difficult political uh, situation within Beirut. Um, the, the, at the time before this happened, on top of coronavirus, there was a huge economic crisis which was happening and there was widespread discontent in, in Beirut and, and broader Lebanon, as well as on top of the, the very large migrant population switch and refugee crisis which you see in the country. So there was a huge problem brewing in Beirut before coronavirus and before this explosion. 
And both these things impacted hugely on their ability to respond. As you can imagine, when there are circa 6,000 casualties in the space of oh, four, six, eight hours, the thoughts of coronavirus pretty much went out of everybody's head. And you know, speaking to the clinicians on the ground, they were just dealing very rapidly with patients in car parks, uh, in makeshift zones, and nobody was even considering coronavirus. Um, there was very little PPE being used and that, that was purely because they were being driven very hard by the mass volume of fairly minor uh, casualties that were turning up, but that still needed to be dealt with. Huge numbers of patients were turning up with injuries from glass, um, et cetera, which also lots of suturing and minor injuries. We had expected to see lots and lots of rehab uh, because of tendon injury, et cetera. But due to the nature of the explosion and the way the casualties turned up, it meant that there was very little tracking of the patients and what was done. So they were registered, it was registered, they were treated, but there was no actual record of what had been done to the patient because it was impossible to keep on top of that. Secondary to all of that, of course, was then the, the protests which happened and the government resignations which happened, uh, and there's still not a fully formed uh, government in uh, Lebanon as we speak. There was also within the first two weeks of the explosion, um, I was informed by the Ministry of Health, somewhere in the region of 150 of the senior doctors from Beirut who all left to take up appointments elsewhere. Uh, the, the staff in Beirut are trained to a very, very high standard and it really is not difficult for them to get jobs in places like Britain, France, uh, Canada, for example, as three of the countries where they go to very easily uh, and they're highly skilled and most of them have trained actually in one of those three countries before returning to Beirut to work. So there was a, a global response to the uh, explosion that was went through the EMT Secretariat in Geneva. Many, many, many NGOs and uh, EMTs deployed into this, but almost everybody deployed with the thought that it was a massive trauma response. Um, and indeed, that, that is what you expect after an explosion of that magnitude. So the Russian teams turned up, Polish teams turned up, uh, Turkish team was involved uh, ourselves. And all of us thought it would be in relation to uh, you know, trauma and that we'd see trauma. So one of the pictures at the bottom is myself with Andy Kent, who's a trauma surgeon from uh, Rig Moore. Um, we, as I said before, we quickly discovered that wasn't the case and within two or three days realised that actually the biggest crisis that was about to happen to the, to the Beirut and the, and the broad country was their now inability to respond to coronavirus. So the initial impact assessment, I say, is, is what we saw. Uh, three hospitals hugely, hugely disrupted um, by it. The central picture here is, is one of the main teaching hospitals and whilst the building itself was structurally sound, every piece of glass, every door had been completely blown off by the, the shock wave from the explosion. And we quickly realised to say that, that we had to morph our response into something which was not um, trauma, but was actually more supportive for the country, which would be helping them to deal with the coronavirus uh, within Beirut and broadly in Lebanon. So the, the EMT Secretariat put the requests out while we were still in country and we developed a team that could then work with the broader healthcare and with the other EMTs in country to make sure that we could do uh, the work that was required. Some of the work that initially was required was really about understanding uh, the initial scope and scale of the damage and then to see where we could develop pathways, protocols, systems, and, and give the support by our clinicians from the U, in the main from the UK to pass on the skills and experience which we had found by unfortunately doing coronavirus um, in the UK. So we very quickly changed and the Polish team went up to work in Tripoli and we stayed in Beirut and uh, worked with four hospitals which were slightly on the periphery on Beirut but which were then designated to take intensive care patients for whoops, coronavirus. 
The important thing really to realise about these sort of responses is you must always, always try to be very agile. What you anticipate going out to is not always what you see. Uh, as Stephen alluded to, I have been to quite a few different responses for both sudden onset disaster and outbreak. And, and in general terms, they are not what you think they're going to be. You have to be extremely capable with you and your team to be able to change how you're going to work, to be flexible enough to understand that you may have deployed to uh, do trauma, or in the case last year when I was working in Mozambique, we thought we were going to be setting up seven small, very small A&Es around um, Vieira district, but actually what we had to do very quickly was begin to treat acute watery diarrhea or cholera um, and deal with that initially and then get back to the A&E work which we were doing. So it's, it's really, really, really important that you have the ability to, to change morph. And, and one of your previous speakers was talking about the ability and to be able to work within that context. So even, and I'm sure Stephen will touch on this about Samoa, even in countries as well developed as Beirut and Samoa, you, you have to understand that they do not have all the equipment that you would be used to. You have to understand that you need to work very closely with the local staff to build their capacity and work with the equipment uh, that they have to deliver the best possible care. And that is sometimes difficult for clinicians from the UK because you're not delivering that, that very great standard of care which can be done in the UK. So the response in Lebanon is still ongoing. Um, we're supporting three hospitals currently with a fourth one which we were supporting, uh, which we've now finished with. We're expanding our programme for another three months and taking on potentially another three hospitals. Uh, and it looks like we'll be expanding that programme even further up into Tripoli to give intensive care support in Tripoli, which is one of the areas which is in the highest level of need. The Polish AMT, EMT were previously supporting that, but unfortunately they had to withdraw to, uh, to support in their own country due to the level of demand in Poland. But they had done an outstandingly good job and really um, it will be us building on their great work in, in Beirut. Um, but there's a huge amount of demand. Uh, but once again, the teams on the ground who were there as part of the blast did such a, an amazing job of being able to deal with that, what was a horrific situation really, with that high level of casualties. And that is a really quick whistle stop of UK Med and UK EMT. Thanks so much, uh, David. That was a fantastic talk. I'm sure um, I might come to it later, but I'm sure we've um, perhaps got a few people interested in joining uh, UK Med after this. Uh, Jensen has asked, obviously given uh, the increasing use of technology and teleconferencing and Teams and Zoom or whatever during the COVID-19 pandemic, how has that changed humanitarian aid and how UK Med works? Yeah, we do, we do a lot of remote support. So it's a lot of the work, even when you've got a team in country, so the team in country in Beirut, what were the, the one sort of group of people we found it very, very difficult to get was uh, intensive care support. Uh, due to the need, you know, everybody wants ICU doctors, right? So what we set up was a, a, a series of webinars um, and coaching, as well as the ability to do a ward round via an iPad as you go around in some of these very small hospitals, so that an ICU doctor who has got huge amounts of experience, they were actually from Italy, could then talk to the doctors on the ground and discuss cases as you go along. So it's really important that you use technology in the best way possible to give access to information, um, because it's not simple. Uh, you know, it is really difficult, even for humanitarians, it's very, very difficult at the moment to travel around the world. Uh, the corridors that are open are very limited. So, but technology has made a huge, huge leap forward, and it's just important to share information. And, um, you know, there's no point in us all writing an SOP, I think I heard somebody talking earlier, but an SOP for um, palliative care. So in Cox's Bazaar, there were three different NGOs developing all the same thing. Um, and, and so we came together and did that as a group. Actually, we did that remotely. Uh, and I did that remotely to supply that to Bangladesh um, whilst I was in uh, Lebanon. So remote work is very, very important and allows us to sh globally to share best practice and, and, and change that to fit the context. Because clearly, 
uh, palliative care is very different in Cox's Bazaar to that which it is in Beirut, for example. A question I had, I noted on one of your slides about the research that UK Motors is involved in regards to climate change, and I wonder what challenges and impacts you are seeing from climate change or what, or, or what you expect to see in the, in the next coming decades. Yeah, I mean, I think we, we probably all are very well cited on that. You know, there's a, a huge increases in migrant populations, and um, which unfortunately uh, leads to a mass increase in the potential for outbreaks. Um, Sudden onset disasters also an impact on that on that hugely, but the the warming of of our climate, the, the issues in relation to to food insecurity. The World Food Programme is doing a great job, but food insecurity is a massive problem. And again, one of your earlier speakers was talking about that. You know, very pertinent to child health and stunting, etc. So um, we we believe there is that it will have a huge impact both from an environmental sense, a uh, food security sense, and, and increasing migration of people to places that are perceived to be better for them, um, and probably are, in fact. Um, so we'll, I personally believe there'll be an increased need for humanitarian support, both at, at a basic level with things like the World Food Programme, but also because there is the potential for increased uh, numbers of outbreaks of a variety of diseases around the world. Yeah. So on a, on a personal on another note, how can if any if anyone in the audience is interested in helping with UK Med, how, how can we do that? What's the process for that? So there's two there's two real ways to do that. Um, we have the UK EMT register, which Stephen is part of, um, and you can apply for that via the website, and that allows you to go through a, a specific uh, onboarding pathway to make sure both that it's the type of work that would suit you and that you would suit the organisation. This is not work that suits everybody. It can be quite challenging, as many of your uh, other contributors have said, and it can be quite physically and mentally challenging for people to do. So it's a question of being able to understand if it's the right thing for you. So it's as simple as going on our website, ukmed.org, um, and there is an application process for the EMT. We have another uh, register, which is called the Humanitarian Health Register, which is a global register and is always increasing in size. Uh, and that is, uh, you can apply to that, but in general terms, that is for people who have been referred to us by personal recommendation. Uh, usually people with some experience, but not necessarily so. Um, you know, you don't have to have humanitarian experience to have a really good life and uh, experiences that will be hugely valuable in a humanitarian humanitarian context and um, so that's the two main routes really to get involved but yeah check out our website it's pretty accessible um, as most websites are really uh, and it's a fairly straightforward process actually and the onboarding is not too difficult once you get through the initial steps. Can I take How is UK Med funded? Sorry. So UK Med's funded so UK Med itself is, is an NGO and so it's funded by charitable donations um, UK EMT, which is we sort of host, if you like, is funded by FCDO, so it's funded by the British government. Um, but we as an NGO are a standalone NGO and funded by charitable donations. I, I wondered if I could um, uh, kind of exert organisers' privilege here just to ask your question, David, on, on the back of that actually is why should NHS organisations, trusts, uh, release staff to join uh, UK EMT or UK Med in their overseas work. What's in short, what's in it for them, and how much does it cost them? So, um, so that route is via the emergency medical teams, um, and it's. I think personally, I think it's hugely important. As you mentioned in that uh, slightly overflattering end, uh, start for me, Stephen, I worked in the NHS for a very, very long time, and I think what it does is it allows you to bring back huge amounts of skills. So when I was doing um, Ebola, you know, you come back. And it allows you to see things very, very differently. It allows you to have gained skills and expertise that are very transferable back into the NHS. So many of our staff who have deployed have now been uh, become COVID-19 leads in their hospitals because of the skills they gained either with diphtheria, uh, doing the measles outbreak, doing Ebola, because they already had the skills in relation to wearing PPE in 40 degrees uh, during the Ebola crisis, you know, and, and how to do that and, and develop the pathways to make it safe. 
so that staff can deal with these very difficult diseases. So it brings a huge amount of skills back. It's also personally very fulfilling for people as well. Um, the, how much does it cost the NHS? Well, it doesn't cost the NHS anything. If you get deployed, um, your trust will, it's kind of like a secondment. Your trust gets the, the cost of you back so that whilst you're away for the period, whether it's three weeks, five weeks, six months, whatever, um, will be reimbursed for your entire cost so they can get locums, um, bank staff, however they choose to fill that um, to make sure that is covered. Great, that is an excellent talk. Thank you very much, David.